Welcome, friends, to the Value Debate Roundtable. It's so good to see all of you here. I hope you've had a great tournament. So my name is Amy Joy Tofty, and I serve as the Director of Education. And today I am joined by the NCFCA founder and board chair, Christy Scheidt. So you're in for a special treat. She's an amazing person and speaker and thinker, and so I hope that you will be blessed by your time here. So today we are going to talk a little bit about our theme and how that applies to value debate. So we know that our theme is building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And as we do that and we come together and we collaborate and we work to, to invest in each other's lives, then we all soar together. So Christy, how do you see that playing out in value debate? As you just said that, I thought, I think that the benefit to those who listen to value debate is actually found in the clash of ideas. And I know that sometimes we're afraid of that. We're afraid to disagree with other people. But the whole idea of debate, and including value debate, is that truth is revealed through clash. And that truth is more trustworthy when it's tested. And so as when we're, we're debating each other, when uh, value debaters facing each other and around are actually doing such a service for each other and for the audience by being willing to put in the time and the work to test each other's ideas and allow the audience to sit and judge which ones are stronger. That's one way for us to reveal truth, and I think that really does edify those who listen. And Christy, we talk about value debate, but imagine that you met somebody on the street and you had 30 seconds to give them an overview. What is value debate? Value debate is a discussion of what we should prioritize when we're making decisions. And we call those priorities values. What should we, what kind of value should drive our decision making? And because what you value does drive that decision. So it's a discussion of what should we value. Okay, so is there a right and a wrong answer when we're in value debate? There's not like black and white, right and wrong, no. And it's they're gonna be two different perspectives um, because both of the things that we're discussing are good things, right? So it's not like one thing is good and the other thing is evil and I'm arguing for good versus evil. And the, the discussion is really about the priority. There's two good things. Ideally, we would want both of them. But when we have to choose one, which one should we prioritize? And it's not that we never choose the other. It's just which one is the default. As I'm going to my decision, I'm going to default toward. So, so to use some language from policy debate, if you're familiar with that, which one am I going to presume in favor of? I'm going to presume, in fa as I go into a decision, I'm going to presume in favor of this good thing and against the other, unless maybe we overcome some barriers and then I might choose the, uh, to prioritize the other thing sometimes. But it's about where should the presumption be. Okay, so what I heard you say is there's no black and white, right and wrong. And that begs the question then, who is best suited to participate in value debate? Value debate is best suited for a philosophical thinker, for someone who is capable of abstract reasoning. So when we're applying that to children, the average age that those skills come online, if you will, is 16. Now that's average, so some kids are ready for it earlier, some later. Um, but I generally say, you know, 16, 15, 16 is a great age. Of course, if you have a kid who's always talking about philosophical concepts and, and deeper values and what drives decision making, then that kid is probably ready. <laughs> I heard you say once, if, if your son goes to bed with the Plato book or you know, yeah. that kind of book, under, then maybe they're ready for value debate. Right. We actually met that kid. Okay. Yes, a young man. He was 13 years old, and he was studying the philosophers like there was no tomorrow. So they, they do exist. They're out there. They so do. if you had to guess, policy first, value first, what would you say? On average, again, I would start younger students with policy debate because it's concrete thinking. And so most 
Students don't develop that abstract thinking you need for value debate until a little later. However, that's, that's individual. And it's not like if somebody enters the league, say, for the first time at 17, that you need to force them to do policy debate first. They may be very capable of already doing the abstract reasoning required for value debate. And just start with value and only do value. I mean, that's fine. But when I'm starting, like for my kids, I've started them all with policy debate when they were young. OK, so who's the they? Sure, my kids, yeah. So I've got five kids. Um, Emma just graduated from college, from Patrick Henry College, and is getting married in August <laughs> to a wonderful Christian young man. And then Rachel is my second. So they, they all competed in NCFCA. And she is my creative artist baker. And so that's the career she's pursuing. Um, Allie is a junior at Patrick Henry College and doing journalism. Aslan is, so I, those three girls are biological, and then I have two boys that we adopted 10 years ago from Haiti, and they are awesome. And Aslan is 16, and he is actually in public school um, playing very serious football, which is fun. And then my youngest is 13, and he competed this year in policy debate in several speeches. I'm still homeschooling him, just finished seventh grade. Okay, very good. So when you're talking about who makes the decisions for whether we do policy debate, who does who makes the decisions for value debate, who should speak into that decision? Parents, first of all, because parents, you know your kids and what their interests are and kind of how their brains are working right now. But also, you know, in combination with if you have a coach in a club, you can get their feedback, especially if as the parent doesn't really know what debate entails. <laughs> It's great if parents work in, um, you know, in combination with the, the coaches. So one thing to know, if you have students who are trying to figure out what to do this year, the That's Debatable camp is actually going to show kind of the same issue from a policy side and a value side to di differentiate the difference and talk about what would that look like. It's a really great way to gauge, is your student able to make that abstract jump so when they hear the hear it presented from the value side, can they follow that? Do they understand that? Do they have the logic and the reasoning to be able to do that? Or are they better suited for something that's going to be pretty concrete? So that'd be a great opportunity. OK, how many of you have been to a previous session? So what's coming next? You're going to stand up and move. So if you can grab your things, we're going to do a would you rather question, since uh, after all, this is value debate, OK? so. Would you rather get the good news first or get the bad news first? So good news people come over here. Bad news people come over here. <laughs> That's all right. Take all our stuff. Take all our Don't stuff. Move. Yep, you're going to be moving to a new table. And you can come back to your table and get your stuff, too, if you need to. Oh, where is it? Oh, boy. This is really interesting. Going good news? Everybody's going bad news first? Bad news. Wow. Everybody is smart. That's why. <laughs> God always works good. Out of we're going we're gonna to end with the hope. Yes. This is good news or bad news first, Hill? Oh. <laughs> that, this is bad. That's bad this is news good first. over here. The good news first is over oh. here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is just a fun activity, but what you're going to do now is look around your group, find six of your best new friends, and find a table to sit together. Okay? So the good news first people already have their group. Yes, your group is just already you. formed. <laughs> yep, sounds good. Feel free to sit at this table right in the front, too. We're not scary. Alrighty. I wanted to see. Hi. I'm Sunny. And oh, you have planes and Everybody knows you. Your last name is Hill. So you know the twins? Do you want to come right up here? Oh. Here we go. If you're just arriving, just fill in at one of these tables. One of these two in front tables here. A few. Maybe this one right here would be great. Awesome. Yeah, but then we only leave one person here. So. Okay. So we 
know that constructive community is the catalyst for growth. So one of the things that we're doing in these roundtables is we're participating in constructive community. It's a brand new community. You don't know each other, but you're going to get to know each other a little bit over the next hour. So these are great things to do in your home and in your club. Have new families over. Do some of these activities. It's a great way to naturally introduce communication skills into your children. So here is how we're going to get to know each other. Go ahead and introduce yourselves to the people at the table. Tell a little bit about yourself. And we're going to mix it up because we're on day four. So let's do, um, let's do something that is unusual that most people wouldn't know about you. And then share your greatest pet peeve when watching, judging, or participating in value debate. Okay? We'll take about eight minutes, so kind of judge the number of people around your table. That'll give you an idea of how long each of you can speak. And we will come back at 1128. That's your signal. You know. Okay. Okay, we are going to come back, and I would love to hear some of your pet peeves. So who has one that they're willing to share with the whole group? <laughs> we will bring the mic to you. Um, so we had a couple things. One was when the uh, competitor blames a judge in, in a sense, like, yeah, that judge didn't understand what I was saying or whatever. And, and, and it's, I, I, my thought was, we've always had the saying, I, you never hire a bad employee. They become bad. You, judges aren't bad. You have to, you have to attend to their, their way of judging in a sense, and how do you figure that out? That's their rule. Um, the other thing that I thought was, uh, I've seen some debates where the competitors begin to become so close in their position, you start to get confused as to who's really debating what what policy, yeah. and that's, you know, stay apart. Stay on, stay on your, stay in your lane and work from there. Uh, was there something else that y'all wanted to share? We good? <laughs> All right, how about over here? What pet peeves did your table come up with? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, so we just have some some really good ones. One is um, when they're not sincere and they say, oh, hi, how are you? Thank you. you know, so I'd like to ask you a few questions or whatever. Yeah. They naturally need to ask you a few questions. Yes. <laughs> and, um, speaking too fast um, for the judge to be able to understand, talking over the timer and um, speaking over each other um, during cross Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Anybody on this side of the room? <laughs> Peeves from this table or here? Okay, here. You can pass it around. I just said, um, no, wrong. The claim without warrant thing, you know, when they just say their response, but don't back it up, don't connect, don't link it to anything. Talking past one another and not listening. I have a lot of patience for it when, when the students are younger and they're just getting the mechanics of the debating. But as they get older and they're still not listening, I just kind of want to shake them a little bit and say, hey, you're missing half of it. Uh, so what I said was the... Um, Turning the values debate into a lighter version of team policy. Free. That's super annoying. <laughs> well, I would just say I'm probably the opposite of what you said, which I feel like I'm a really poor judge, but I feel like I don't do the judge justice when they're really invested and I can't follow things. So I do feel like in that case, I know there are other parents like that. And when the kids really care, and maybe I don't have an interest in the topic that I feel like that's where, that's my pet peeve. One encouragement, this is from way back when we used to have the judge orientation with the flip book. You know what I'm talking about? One of the lines in, in that script was, it is the competitor's responsibility to communicate with you. And that gave me a lot of freedom because, that, you know, if I'm a new, new judge and I've told you that, then you have to educate me. You can't just start at a PhD level because I haven't researched this topic the way you have. So bring me along in the journey. And that freed me to be able to realize as a judge, that's the feedback that I can give to them to help them 
to understand there are going to be other people like me that you're going to have to start a little bit lower level to get us to where you are. One, one, just one more thing. The other thing that pays me more deeply is that I know I did the two two round, which I was totally inept. But the the team I had to lose ended up winning by beating it. Well, there so you go. I think the system works. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How about this table over here? Anyone want to share? Uh, here, let me give you the mic. So there was a lot of what we're used to, which is don't like uh, the lack of genuineness in the openings, um, the pat openings, that kind of thing, uh, and the fast talking, when we, especially when we told them not to do fast talking. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and then from another perspective, looking at when dealing with the frustrations of the LD student who is dealing with being judged from a team policy perspective. Truth instead of mm -hmm. from a Lincoln-Douglas perspective. And although there's good learning in that, it is frustrating. Yes. Tina, you brought up a great point that I think we have to talk about. And that is how do we help our students to care about the person that is standing next to them, right? To see them as a human being, not just as the goal to be accomplished or to conquer. Or, and and that's, that's a really important skill that's going to take them throughout their life. We're always going to have people, difficult conversations that we have, but that is a person made in the Imago Dei, made in the image of God, and we have to treat them with a certain level of respect, and, and that is a growth process for sure, for sure. I have one, um, which is just, they don't, they leave, use so many big words and don't simplify it, that you just get lost in it. So. And that too is a skill. Learning to be able to take your area of expertise and explain it at a fourth grade level. I, I think it's interesting. I, I, I am a student of history and I love to watch how things evolve and, and come to in this new state. So we have all these different translations of scripture. And the one that always stood out to me is when the NIV came into existence, it spread like wildfire. And I was fascinated as, to know why. Why was that? Why did this, this particular translation of scripture just... And the reason is because it's written at a fourth grade level. Think about that. So more people could access thoughts that they really couldn't understand prior to that. So I'm not advocating for a particular type of scripture, more to say we need to acknowledge the fact that we have to speak to the person in front of us, not, not to somebody that has sparred with us for six, eight, nine months on a topic that we know really well. So filling in the gaps for people. Th these are great. I, I love these. Um, Christy, one of the things that we hear often is, is what this gentleman said here about value debate becoming mini TP. Right. So let's just talk about that a little bit. How are the two different? Yes. Um, so they really are different. Value debate is really the debate of philosophers. So when you go and read philosophy books, when you read uh, journal articles from philosophers who are doing the work of philosophy. It is literally exactly the same as writing a value debate case. First, they're defining their terms very carefully, and defining terms for philosophers is a big deal. That is not <coughs> trivial. And secondly, they are defining a standard by which they are going to judge the issue at hand. Right, so there's always a question that they're trying to solve, some question that they're addressing. First, define their terms. Second, they define a value standard. I mean, they might not call it a va value standard, but they'll say, the goal is justice or something like that. The goal is liberty. But how do we measure that? How do we know when justice has been achieved? How do we know when liberty has been achieved? Well, the best way to measure that in this context is, and then they'll give some specific what do you think? Criteria. It's exactly the same as developing a value standard for a value case. And then they'll go on usually to apply it to a few real, real world situations just to flesh it out, just to say, so here's how it would look if we applied that value standard to a few <coughs> situations, just to give a, a, an illustration of what that looks like. So that is what value debate does in a nutshell. Policy debate comes after values debate. So just as I was talking at the beginning of the session, values drive our decision making. And whether you admit it or not, there's a value driving your decision making. 
sometimes we pretend like our value is justice or freedom for all, but really it's something else like greed and making money. Um, but there is a value underlying it, right? And it will drive your decision. So you want to look at those values and, and, and discuss what should drive our decision making. Okay, but that's completely different than then applying that into the policy arena and saying, therefore, the government should do X or Y. The government should make this or that policy. That question of, therefore, then the government should do this or that policy is not the question of value debate. So I like to use the illustration of abortion as a great differentiation between the two. The question of which should we value, the life of the unborn child or the freedom, autonomy of the mother? That's a value question. And you can, I think you can start to conceive how you could have a debate about just that without getting into abortion policy itself. If you're just debating which should we value more, which should we prefer, the life of the unborn child or the choice of the mother? And then the policy question comes after that, okay? Because first you have to answer the value question. Well, we value the life of the unborn child. Therefore, our policy should be we're going to ban abortion. Or the other way, we value the choice of the mother more. Therefore, we are going to allow abortion. So that's, that's the difference, and that's how it works in the real world as well. So if I'm right, value debate is historically old. It's been around oh, for a yes. long time. Yes, so, thousands of years. And there are other organizations that do value debate as well. So what makes NCFCA different? Well, just to clarify a little bit of the history, value debate as an academic debate is fairly new, really from the 60s or 70s. So it's not as well codified as policy debate. Um, but the thing that distinguishes NCFCA value debate the most is our Christian worldview. Um, but I think we're also distinguished by our emphasis on values and philosophy. So those are the two distinguishers. Of course, the more important one is that our whole goal with value debate is helping ambassadors for Christ learn how to discover and weigh values so that they can apply that to decision-making in a way that honors the Lord so that they can discover, hey, what values are really involved in this decision and what should drive our decision making? And then along with their parents and their churches and their communities and their clubs, our prayer is that they would adopt a biblical, biblical values and be able to identify those and then use biblical values to make the decisions for their lives and for, for everything that they do. So let's talk a little bit about how value debate fulfills the mission of NCFCA. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can see it here. Value debate absolutely challenges and equips our young people. It is very challenging, and it equips them with so many skills. I've just been mentioning them. Um, the skills to be able to really examine the core drivers the core motivations of decisions. So not just like what we should do and how things work, but why. Why should we do this? And one illustration of that, um, you know, this is all about being ambassadors for Christ, communicating truth with integrity and grace. Truth, I mean, truth is a person, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But God's word is also truth. So we've, there's a couple of ways we can know truth. The Bible is probably the most concrete way because it's written out for us. Thank you, God, for sending us your word so that we can have something really concrete to go to. And there's a great passage of scripture that I think perfectly illustrates value debate in scripture. So I think, do we have those slides next? Yes. All right, so 1 Corinthians 13 is a value case. All right, so he starts off by saying, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, you know this, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Do you guys see a clash of two values here in this verse? Anybody want to shout out? 
the clash of values here? Communication skills, speaking in the tongues of men and of angels, that's great. We would all love to do that. Remember we said it's always a clash of two good things, right? <clears throat> and what's the other value here? Love. Right. So he's saying, okay, if I'm weighing out the most amazing communication skills ever versus love, love is higher. And as you know, the whole chapter is making that case. All right, and let's get into the why a little bit. There's a lot of the why. I left out, there's a ton in the chapter, but so what's the reason to prefer? Sometimes in value debate, we say reason to prefer, right? What's the reason to prefer love? Well, he goes into saying like, that first verse kind of gives us, love gives meaning to everything else. If you don't do things with love, then it's just empty and nothing and pointless and meaningless. So love gives meaning to everything else. That's why we ought to prefer it. And this is the second reason to prefer, because love never ends. It's eternal. And then he goes through some of the other values that are, he's contrasting in the chapter. As for prophecies, that's a good thing, but it's not eternal. It will pass away. As for tongues, also great. They will cease. As for knowledge, even, it will pass away. But love never ends. That's the second reason we should prefer it. So then he concludes his value debate case. And he concludes with the three greatest things. Now, So now faith, hope, and love abide. Those all abide. Those are all good. They're pretty high. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So I'm curious if you were judging this value debate, would you have been able to follow it? It's pretty, pretty simple, right? So let's see what that looks like when we now apply that to this topic. <laughs> I won't be as good at that. At that. <laughs> All right, so this is our choice for next year, next season, right? The individual right to property ought to be valued above the economic interests of the community. I, just, I want to apply just that Christian worldview to this, though. <coughs> so... I, I did this when we were doing our value debate resolution roundtable, so indulge me if you're hearing this twice. <laughs> but I want our students to start, and parents and coaches, everyone, to start by thinking, how should we think Christianly, biblically, about this clash of two things? They're both good, right? And they both have value. So I would say we need to start by looking at the big picture, the big underlying philosophy, and the reasons why people have advocated for one or the other being prioritized. Big picture. So you're talking um, economics, you're talking individual rights, and there's a ton of literature on that. You're talking property, specifically property rights, another wealth of literature. So digging into those concepts and understanding the different opinions, understanding the why of those opinions, not just the in place where they land, but how they got there, and then comparing that reasoning to biblical values. Now, you're going you're, you're gonna to find biblical values on both sides. All right? So the challenge is, of course, is that reason to prefer one over the other. And look, this is debatable among Christians, right? That's, that's fine. We can debate which one we should prefer in different contexts. And it might even change based on the context. That's okay. But that, that's the process that I would outline for you and ask yourself, what, what would I value as a Christian and why? And there's going to be a Christian perspective, like I said, on both sides. It's something that we can debate and discuss. And remember that the other person in the round, your opponent, is not someone to crush like we were talking about earlier. But that person is your ally because they have put in so many hours and so much of their effort and work to agree to come and discuss this with you, to test your ideas together. And at the end of the round... I mean, ideally, you have a great round where both of you just challenge and test the other, and in that way, you are equipping one another 
to improve your skills. And after the round, you should thank that person. Even if they beat you, you should be like, thank you so much for putting in the time and effort to give me a really great test of my skills and my ideas. So that's the mindset that I think keeps us from being insincere and all of that. And by the way, just a quick word about the, the little rote greetings and stuff. Kids do that because they don't know what to say. And so they just have this little memorized script, and it's easy to say, and they heard it 100 times in 100 rounds, and they just blurt it out. <laughs> so that's a coaching issue that we can say. Just have a great opener and use your individual personalized to your case opener, and you don't have to do all that ritual stuff. Once they get comfortable. Sometimes I let my little guys do the ritual because it helps them feel safe and like they know what they're doing. But anyway. That's great. Several years ago, a group of NCFCA folks met in Texas for some strategy meetings to really think through the direction of the league for the next several years. Where are we? We started with where have we been? Where have we been? Where are we right now? And where is the Lord calling us to go? And values were the underlying issue that we were looking at. So talk about our values and how they drive our decision-making in NCFCA. Sure, yeah. So here are our values, redeeming truth, godly wisdom, gracious communication. You can see that in our mission statement as well. And of course, the truth and the wisdom are in our mission statement. Enduring excellence, constructive community. So I've already been touching on <laughs> some of these as we've talked and just showing you how our values inform the way we want value debate to look. That constructive community, I was just talking about that. The way that you view your opponent in the round. We want it to be a constructive community. Our verse for this value is, as um, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And, and sharpening, that's not a, the, doesn't always feel nice, right, to have somebody correct you or push back, but it does make you sharper. So let's embrace that. Um, enduring excellence is one that I think we have been has been our value for years, and I do think we do things in an excellent way, but we want it to be enduring. So I would say value debaters, don't burn yourselves out. So when you're trying to go for excellence, it's possible to burn that candle on both ends and then crash, <laughs> and that's not enduring, right? So you need to have balance in your life. Be excellent, but have balance in your life so you have an excellence that endures. Gracious communications, we talked about a little with some pet peeves, right? And, and Amy Joy, you were getting to this. It's, I guess it's easy to get into our heads and just be thinking about the arguments I want to make and the case and, oh, this piece of evidence and what, what am I saying here and the outline, rather than to think, I'm discussing this with another fellow human being and I'm speaking to an audience of fellow human beings. <laughs> and we want to just exude. I hope you were here for Mike Shutt earlier. We just want to exude God's grace. God's grace fills us up and then just spills over onto everyone else. It goes along with our verse we chose for this uh, nationals that our speech is edifying to those who listen. Um, the godly wisdom and the redeeming truth. Godly wisdom, of course, is based on who God is, and I would just refer to Mike Shutt's devotional this morning and also his speech here that we can't know, we don't have wisdom without knowing God, right? The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And with philosophy especially, that's a search for wisdom. It's really remarkable to me how many philosophers have rejected God and yet still think they can find wisdom. <laughs> You'll be comforted to know, however, that there are many philosophers and some major names and some names that would be familiar to you who are Christians, who definitely embrace God. Um, but, of course, in the more modern times, a lot of them reject that. The funny thing is, is that what I'm seeing in, in philosophy is that as they reject God, many philosophers come to a point where, well, we can't know anything. It's impossible for us to know anything. So without that godly wisdom, that's where we're going to end up <laughs> with when we're doing philosophy. And then the redeeming truth. I, again, Mike Shutt was talking about this. We want our kids to learn 
how to identify and apply the truth in a redemptive fashion, to bring redemption into the world, as that's what Jesus did for us, and that's what we do in a smaller way as Christians, as little Christ, as ambassadors for Christ, is to bring that redemption into other people's lives. So that's our, th- these are our values, and I hope they inform your value beliefs. Okay, so our next activity together, we're going to start. If you'll take the cards in the center of your table, if you're willing to write your name and contact information uh, on the card, I want you to know that every piece of feedback that you give to us, we read. And if there's ever a question or I ever think, hey, I'd love to know more about this, I will personally contact you. Uh, If you don't want to leave your name and email, that's okay too. But I want you to think to, to the value debate that you've experienced in the past calendar year. And I want you to think about one, we call it a rose, something that just really stood out to you. Maybe it's a particular round that you saw. Maybe it is um, a victory that you saw in a student competing and a change that you saw in that student, but just something positive that you've seen in the past calendar year. So go ahead and that, jot that down on your card, and then we're going to come around. I'd love to hear your ideas, but we'll give you a few seconds to think. All right, does anyone have a rose that they would like to share? Let's start over here first. I just love seeing how um, competitors can be, still be friends with their opponents after a stinging defeat. And sometimes my son does that better than I do. And he'll defend his opponent and say, no, mom, they really did do a better job. And so I think that's just such a growing and valuable skill. And I will say, I do feel like our LD community does that well, right? I, I've seen that multiple times where, I mean, there's, there's good clash in the round, and they walk out, but they're not quite done discussing it. They're like, hey, you want to go eat lunch together? We'll finish our conversation. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's really, really awesome. So this happened yesterday. I was <clears throat> going in to judge uh, LD round, and as I walked in the hallway to the door, there were two s- competitors, and they were praying together. And when I, when they came in the room together, I'm like, oh, okay. They were the competitors competing against each other, and they knew that. I didn't know it, so I saw this beautiful thing and then realized, oh, they're, the, they're, they're fixing to debate each other. So that was really neat. Just that it teaches them to, and really this is in all of debate and even more, that teaches them to learn both sides of an issue and um, think for themselves, make their own decisions. So I've been coaching debate for quite a while, and I think one over the just the course of the many years, one of the biggest roses is seeing these students when they come in and they're young and they're scared and they're deer in the headlights and they don't know how to, st- they just don't want to stand up in front and they struggle to get through. And then you've, as you work with them and the development of them over the years where they're confident in front of a, a room full of people and and it's not just that success, though, but as I've seen them grow in their skills, I've watched so many of them grow in their character. And that, to me, honestly, is the biggest rose, is seeing that. So working with these students over, like, a decade, it's not just the skills, but it's the character of the students that I've been able to work with. And it's been such a blessing. Okay. All right. Anybody on this side of the room? Was very similar to that one, so I'll just follow up on it. Um, I was just gonna, I was just gonna talk about uh, one of my students, um, and he, he went. He, it's, it's actually a two-year period, but he came in like stammering, incoherent. Um, actually, I'd say like severe speech impediments. Like he was really struggling, and um, I just watched him 
and I, I coached him one year, and then um, one of my alumni actually took over and coached him this year, and he's at nationals, and I heard him speak, and it was such a dramatic change. It blew me away, and, um, but the character part of it is what's really beautiful because um, I see him, he has like a compassion for novices, and he has a humility that comes from knowing where he came from. And and um, and I think that's it's just a really beautiful thing. And so, I come from a slightly different perspective than probably most of the people in this room because I am an alumni, uh, <laughs> and I think that one of the biggest changes for me has been spending more time with the parents of trainees and getting to see kind of you know, what goes on in Judge Hospitality, you know, the kind of the magical place where all the snacks come from. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's been kind of inspiring and heartening for me to see that all of the parents who are involved in speech and debate are so much more concerned with the character of the students. And that's what, like, we've been hearing now. Like, these people want their children to succeed but they are much more invested in their children becoming godly people, becoming wise people. And it is such a, a blessing for me to see that this is really what this community is about. I have so many things, but I'll try to keep it succinct and go a different direction. And that is the grasp of the ideas and the resolution, because I've this is our fourth year in the NCFCA, and I've come to be convicted that it's the resolution is slightly prophetic because I have seen a pattern between the, the, the resolutions where they dig into them and they study those topics, and the next year it's extremely relevant that they understood that from energy to privacy to candidates to terrorism, all of those things, and my kids have walked away with a much deeper understanding of the concepts that would come up the next year. And so when we when we got this value resolution this year, nobody knew what these principles were, what they would mean, why we're having this discussion. But the growth in, in my LDR this year in studying these principles and why they actually matter has been um, encouraging because he's dug into the Great Reset and the Econo World Economic Forum and all of these ideas that they're going to have to, transhumanism, right? They're going to have to face these and have a position. And so digging into that, they're, they're, they're going to go forward with some knowledge that will enable them to make better decisions and advocate for hopefully what we want them to advocate for. I have a small one here. Um, I this was something I saw during the uh, online year. Uh, so a bunch of students in our region, uh, normally I often seen people being very competitive and trying to sort of hold things back. But with LD, what was interesting was just saw a group of people being willing to share and to say, uh, just to help each other and say, hey, there's a better definition here, or there's a better source, or here's a philosophy you should, you should think about. And there was a big contrast to some, some of the things I sometimes see with uh, team policy students being very protective and secretive. But, but just seeing this other side open up where everyone's really helping each other. And I saw this thing where a lot of these students that were not breaking, suddenly, I think last year I saw this really, to me it was surprising. It, I sort of attributed to this um, willingness to talk, to talk and share and, and encourage one another. Seeing so many of these students all breaking out was just really uh, an encouraging thing that people were not hiding. They're just trying to help each other. They're being selfless. I thought that was very encouraging. That's not a little thing, by the way. That was the big thing. <laughs> well, you know, we're all here at the Nationals, and we are very proud of our kids, and we um, really um, admire all the students, you know, who are really good, right? But um, looking back, I think um, there's one student in our club, and I judged a T, um, TP uh, round. And before I walk in the room, they were already there, but before the round starts, this student asked the other student to go out and they played together and they came back during the round. Um, he was being, he looks like he's the oldest among the four students. 
and he was being really gracious um, because obviously the other team were novices, you know, he was being really um, gracious not to pursue like, you know, something. Um, but then later um, I learned that um, he's been in speech and debate for three or four years. This is our first year, so I did not know him before. But he never broke. He never broke in any tournament. But, you know, he's the one that really blessed my heart. And uh, yeah. I love that call out because we need to elevate stories of character over stories of just place placings, right? I, I think so about that even really for good. us when we're judging, it's so easy to judge the technical skills. But what would it look like if on the ballot we're like, wow, in that one moment, I really saw your character shining through. How would that influence a student, even if they lost the round? So the great ideas. We're gonna do the next two together. So here's what I, I want you to do. Think of a thorn an obstacle, a frustration, something that gets in the way, right? We want these gracious communicators and these value debates. We want them to be awesome. So why aren't they yet? Like, what are some of the obstacles that get in the way in value debate? And then at the same time as you're thinking about that, the but is, let's talk about some ideas for the future. What are some ways that we could address that in our homes, in our clubs, in this league? Is it a resource issue? Is it a conversation issue, a training issue? So put your mind to that and just say, what, what are some ideas that we could implement? We'll give you a little bit of time to think and then we'll come around. anyone like to share some of the obstacles that you've seen in your students or even in yourself as you're coaching? Yes. And this is kind of a combination of both. So one thing we talked about in the pet peeve section is towards the end of the season, especially in regions, the cases begin to blend. You know, they've hurt each other, they've lost to that case, so they try to fit it in their case. And um, sometimes I think it's hard for the students to improve towards the end because they, uh, they're they kind of cluttered with other cases or maybe with a little bit of malaise. So the bud to that is um, in the pandemic, and I know we always talk about well, some positive things, is I feel like the kids in our region and across the nation got a lot more connected through chats mm -hmm. and Zoom calls. And so one thing I found my own kids were setting up debates with people from all over the place this spring. I'm like, do you know that person? You know, if, and then they would maybe be on a big chat together and they would just sort of throw out who would, who would be willing to debate me. And of course people were eager to practice and just getting that experience, non-competitive, very friendly, give feedback to each other and, and do it very easily through chats and through Zoom. So that seems the bud of like rather just sort of, you know, you're just grinding away over sort of the same territory that you keep hearing in your region. It's giving them fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, fresh feedback from other students. And it was really nice to see. We've got a lady right here. Just a two, one is fast talking and then one is just organizing rebuttals. Any thoughts on how we could address those? Yes. We could. I think we could address anything through how we train our judges because the judges give the rewards in the awards. It's not the people on the stage. The judges are giving those. So if we train the judges and we train ourselves to reflect that on the ballot, I'm not saying that yesterday, I'm just saying now, then um, the students should follow suit. It, you know, slow down. Don't speak over the timer all day. We do an exercise in our home. So I don't know if you've ever seen the, the slow jam videos where they take something that somebody said and they make it really, really slow. We practice that way. I'm like, okay, so go give your speech in front of the mirror. Um, my, my son, um, perspective. For those of you who used to have to do script submission and you had to count your words, <laughs> my son John broke to nationals with a speech that had 26 hundred words in a 10 minute speech. That's a lot of words. 
is a lot of words, right? So over the course of his six years, that number dropped almost in half. And so some of that is just a growth of, of learning that you have to slow down and give people a chance to process what you're saying. But a fun activity is to have them actually practice it in slow motion and they feel like they're just going so slow. But sometimes you're like, <clears throat> right, that's exactly the tempo I need you to go at. You thought you were going in slow motion and it's actually normal tempo. So one last thorn, yep, go ahead, one last thorn. That's funny, Amy Joy, because I make my kids practice in double time. And if they can't get their 10-minute speech uh, down to four minutes, it's too long. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Good memorization skill, too. Okay, um, so my thorn uh, would be like, lack. okay, so first of all, I'm going to back up. My rose was a younger child being guided by an older brother this year, Absolutely. which is just beautiful, because Mama really wasn't, um, didn't have a, I wasn't with her, right? And, and he was, and um, so then my thorn is lack of content or wanting to go deeper, and as a parent, um, not having the, the, the time to get into the resolution, but still wanting to walk alongside um, my students. So, um, you know, this is my summer that I'm committing to learning LD with my daughter, so I'm available to be with her. And, and one of the things I'd like to do for the folks in our club is create talking points for parents, real easy entry talking points that could just be grabbed off the kitchen table, and the students can run the discussion right there. But just so, um, like, a scaffold to help folks like me enter in with them. That's great. If you, you know, I, I say this a lot, but answers are cheap, questions are priceless. And if you can increase your toolbox with some really key questions, there aren't a lot of them, you can repurpose almost all of them over and over and over again. But learning to engage your child and give them the opportunity to speak rather than speaking at them, you'll see growth that you can't even, can't even imagine. Speaking of growth, oh, yes. So this is an illustration of what growth looks like. We all know this in plants. But sometimes, and I am guilty of this, sometimes we can expect to teach our kid who's the little seedling right here, and then, oh, in two months, you're going to be a full sunflower. <laughs> So this is just our final thought to share with you today is that we all need to be patient. We just need to be patient and gracious and generous to our kids and give them time. I know as a homeschool mom, sometimes I'd think, oh, hey, you got this concept so quickly. I'm going to teach you another concept yes. on Tuesday and another concept on Wednesday and another one on Thursday. And then they were just floundering. And I didn't realize how much time they needed to just let one concept sink in for a while <laughs> before introducing the next and the next and the next. So that's just our admonition to you. Don't get, don't get frustrated. Your child is normal. This is how you learn. This is how I learn. It takes time. And just enjoy the process of growing with your child. So Christy, next steps for the folks who want to help a new student get into value debate or take a value debater to that next level, what would you recommend? For new students and like people who've never done it before, I'd, I'd highly recommend our camp, That's Debatable, on June 29th. We record it as well, so you don't, you're don't you not locked into June 29th. You can get the recording. But this is going to be a very fun introduction. We're going to do fun debate topics. We're not doing the resolutions. Um, so this is to help them get their feet wet. And it's especially for the student who's like, oh, I'm not sure if this is going to be fun or if I, if I can do it, to help them get the taste for it and love the activity, but we are really going to be laying the foundation for both policy and value debate during this camp. So they won't really realize that, <laughs> but the foundation will be laid. Um, and then for those of you who are already doing value debate and want to dig into this year's resolution, or even if you're new but you want to dig into this year's resolution, we are going to have a, an entire day where we really go deep with all of those issues, with the philosophies, with potential values, with all the discussions, like a huge national level, deep discussion with the members of the debate committee, with um, topic area experts. I'll be the MC, and we will have lots of Q&A and interaction. So that's a great way to kick off your year. I would recommend also parents who want to come alongside their kids to do that with their kids.
that would be so such a great way for everybody to just get a one-day crash course on what this year's resolution is about. Great. We will stay around after. If you have questions that are specific to your student or your club, feel free to reach out to us. Also, I just want to put a plug out there. We are in the process of rewriting our curriculum and, and developing a, a really cohesive curriculum that I think will be a great resource for, for future students. So if that's something you're interested in, if you would say, hey, I've got some background and experience in, in education or in curriculum writing, please, please, please reach out to me. We would love to expand our team to get a few more different perspectives. Uh, my email address is amyjoytofty at ncfca.org. And I also just want to encourage you, if you have feedback for the league, please share it with us. We, we take your feedback really seriously. And I think if you look over the past five years, there have been a lot of changes made in this league. And that is because we are responding to the people who have spoken in to what their needs are and how we can best serve them. So we would love to hear from you. You can send those requests. If it's education specific, you can send it directly to me. If it's if it's wider league or based on forensics, you can send that to our office. So we would and, love. And you can write to also debate committee, one word, debate committee at ncfca.org if you have questions or comments or issues or anything debate related. Well, Christy, thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure, my friend. And for the rest of you, if you would like to hear about the heart of this league, about the vision of where we're going and why, how our values are driving those decisions, you're going to have a great opportunity to meet our board this afternoon. And so come on back and you, you can ask questions. You can ask hard questions if they need to be asked. This is the time to do that. So thanks so much for coming and have a great afternoon.